The following is a conversation with Yaron Brook. He is the co author of Equal is Unfair and Free Market Revolution. He is also the current chairman of the board at Iron Institute. When I first discovered him, uh, the idea of objectivism, which he actually champions, changed my, my world. You know, it turned it upside down. There are things we hear that confirms what we know, but this actually turned it upside down and actually opened my mind to the possibility that, you know, I do not know it all inside it. Like, you know, the religion isn't what's the only thing, the, the only thing that you've been brainwashed about. So this uh, this conversation was uh, uh, was recorded some weeks ago, before our outing at Jebu, the thought Jebu. We spoke about capitalism. We even spoke about Shemkuti and the socialist idea, a very bad idea in my opinion. We spoke about religion. We talked about reason and faith. We talked about uh, science. We talked about Africa's unity and why we are where we are. So I'm very sure you guys uh, will enjoy this conversation. You will enjoy this conversation, and uh, 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 it will turn your your world, you know, upside down in a good way, in a very good way. It will open your mind to possibilities, some things you've never heard before, some things, you know, <laughs> like the idea of selfishness, selfishness being good, and and know, and 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 the, and the way Aaron talked about it, and the way Aaron is talking about it. So, I like the idea of objectivism. I don't think it's it is. There are some uh, things I'm trying to work out, work through right now. But it's great, you know, the, the convention will be great. You you enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy it, guys. Enjoy the convention. Uh, all right. I should actually shoot. I, I should actually start the interview, you know. I, I, uh, oh, 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 can you just introduce me to what you actually know about Nigeria, you know? What you know about, about Nigeria, you know? How much do you know about Nigeria? How much do I know about Nigeria? Uh... Not a huge amount, a, a, a little bit, a, a, you know, a little bit about oil, a little bit about, uh, you know, the North, the, the Islamic terrorism, but not much about. And Nigerian immigrants to the U.S. do very, very well. Yeah. Uh, but it, about about the internal politics and the internal stuff going on in Nigeria, I know nothing. Wow, wow interesting. All right. All right. I, I was told to actually say you know, some of my... You know, so some of my uh, followers actually told me to actually say hi to you. You know, you know, like they, some of my followers are actually a fan of your show. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, all right. I should start the interview. Uh, a lot of people are not are not familiar with uh, with Iran. You know, I I I got to know Iran in detail through your interview with uh, Lex Friedman. And uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 then I looked you up. I, 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 I've been a fan of your, your first interview with him. You know, I've mm -hmm. been a fan, fan of your show since then. Uh, so uh, can you give me a, a little, a brief introduction into objective, objectivism? You know, the, the philosophy of, of Iran. Sure. I mean, Ayn Rand was, was both a philosopher and a novelist. Uh, her most famous books are After Shrugged and the Fountainhead. And in those books and in a lot of uh, her philosophical writings, what she does is presents a case for living on earth, for living the best life that you can, uh, uh, you know, while you're alive on this planet, right? So it's, it's a philosophy that advocates that reason is our only means of knowing the world, uh, that uh, reason is our, our, our basic means of survival, it's what we should be cultivating. It what it's what we should be emphasizing. The standard for our life, the moral standard for our life, should be our own happiness, our own success. Uh, your own life should be your moral standard. You should live for yourself in that sense, uh, not sacrificing yourself to other people, not expecting them to sacrifice for you. And the only political system that is appropriate for people pursuing their own happiness, uh, pursuing their own life, is capitalism. Capitalism is a system of freedom. It's a system of individual rights. It's a system in which the only job of government is to protect your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The only role of government is to protect you from crooks and fraudsters. So she's not a statist. She, she, she rejects both communism on the left, if you will, and fascism on the right, she rejects all force of all forms of government intervention in the economy. So it's really a philosophy about you know how to live your life the best that you can. 
All right, all right, all right. You, you are, you know, uh, uh, you said something just now about the limits of, uh, of uh, how, how far should the government go in, 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 in the interference of in people's lives, you know. Basically, uh, government should have uh, almost no interference in people's lives. The government should uh, leave you alone, and as long as you're not hurting other people, it's none of their business. The only job of the government is to protect your freedom to act based on your reason in pursuit of your values. So they're protecting you. Who are they protecting you from? They're protecting you from crooks and criminals and murderers, uh, you know, thieves, uh, fraudsters, people who commit fraud, and from foreign invaders, from people, terrorists, and people who would invade your country and, and hurt you. So the military, the only thing the government should be doing is a police, a judiciary to arbitrate disputes, and a military to protect your borders. Uh, and that's it. Other than that, the government should be hands off, no welfare, no regulations, no controls. The government should own no property, should own no natural, so-called natural resources. It sh all of that should be private and, and markets should be left free uh, to produce and consumers should be left free to consume. All right. All right. Then what's your take on... on uh... On the government's billing, billing uh, Tesla out, you know, I think I think yearly uh, uh, the U.S. government gives Tesla some amount of money, and, and the same thing is going on in Nigeria. Uh, Dangote, you know, I, I don't know if you know Dangote, is richest no. black African uh, black man, you know, and is Nigerian, and and, and uh, the government in Nigeria bills bills him out every single year. Yep. You no, know? so what's your take on that? I mean, obviously, I'm against it. I'm against any government involving the economy, both bailouts, subsidies, uh, but I'm also against regulation and, and, and taxes. So the government should just stay out of all economic activities. I mean, I wish, I wish we had a constitution that separated state from economics. That is, the state cannot intervene in the economy, not in the positive in the sense of bailing people out, or the negative in the sense of regulating them and shutting them down. The government has often forced companies to shut down, um, it has picked winners and losers and, uh, it, you know, it's often bailed out companies, whether it's Tesla, whether it's the banks during the financial crisis, uh, whether it's uh, an insurance company, AIG during the financial crisis or, or solar panel manufacturers, or all kinds of companies are constantly being bailed out by the government. Government should have zero zilch, no involvement. So or what do you mean by regulation in taxes? You know, you're against regulation in taxes. Um, I, you know, government should have no ability to tell me who I can hire, how much to pay them, what kind of benefits to give them. All of those are regulations. Your the government should have no, no say in what product I sell, what the quality of the product is, what the safety record of the product is. Uh, you know, unless I'm committing fraud, the government has no business telling me what I can and cannot sell. Uh, if, if somebody uh, is hurt by my product, they have the ability to sue me. If it turns out that I put out the product purposefully to hurt people, then the government can intervene. But, uh, you know, so no safety regulations, no, you know, if, if, if uh, no uh, uh, workplace safety regulations, for example. If workers think that my workplace is too dangerous, don't come to work, you know, uh, you know refuse to work or... Demand a, um, a risk premium uh, on your wages. But it's none of the government's business. All of that is to be negotiated between workers uh, and, uh, and uh, the companies, between the companies and the consumers, all of that. And, and then, of course, people have recourse against the company. If they can show that a company was negligent, then they can sue the company. And that's what the courts are there for. So there's liability law. If you buy a product and it turns out not to work the way you expected it to work, you can sue me. And then we have a legal system that, that uh, you know, determines whether you're right or I'm right. But the government shouldn't try to preempt and tell me your product has to be have these dimensions and be made of this material and have these qualities. And uh, those kind of regulations should all be banned. They should not be allowed. Uh, and, and all this is predicated on the, on, the, on the belief or on the sense that people are capable, capable of making choices, you know. Uh, are people capable of making choices for themselves? No? I, Absolutely. I mean, I, it's, all, it's all contingent on the idea 
that fundamentally what makes us human is the fact that we are rational. We all have that capacity to think and to choose our own values, to, to make estimations about the risk we're willing to take. That doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that some people out there in the world um, default on the responsibility of being rational and, and, and act stupidly. But the fact that somebody else acts irrationally does not give you or the government the right to penalize me who are acting rationally. So by regulating, we're treating everybody the same. And we're, t we're assuming that everybody, nobody can act rationally. So I'm saying, yeah, people, people do stupid things, but that's their problem. And let them uh, figure that out and let them recover from it. Don't penalize the rational. Don't penalize the moral for the sins of the irrational or the immoral. All right, all right. Uh, uh, and and you mentioned something about the welfare states, you know, like like the welfare states. The welfare states is basically given to those who have who are who need to have the ability to actually provide or the will to actually provide, uh, um, the ability to actually provide for themselves, you know. But don't you actually think you need government to serve as as a patron of some sense, you know? You know, patron actually collects money and actually uh, it returns it turns it back to, to the creator. So do you think people, if given a chance, to actually give to the community, we actually give back to their community without, you know, willingly, you know, could people do that? Well, first of all, I hate the term give back because you didn't take anything. So what are you giving back to? Uh, you only give back after you've taken, right? So yeah. you haven't taken anything. So would people give? Well, it depends, right? I think the government today gives way too much welfare to way too many people, people who can take care of themselves, people in a free market who would have jobs, and who would be doing much, much better, much, much better financially and psychologically if they weren't dependent on government handouts. So in a free market, very, 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 very few people cannot take care of themselves, cannot feed their own families, cannot get a job, cannot work, cannot make what people call a living wage. I think what suppresses wages is the welfare state, is the regulatory state, is government intervention in the economy. So let's have a free market and then encourage people to get a job and then eliminate welfare. Now, for the fraction, the tiny, less than 1% of people who cannot work, who cannot take care of themselves, will there be enough welfare? Absolutely. Will there be enough charity? Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Americans in uh, free countries generally uh, are, are unbelievably charitable. Uh, they're happy to help people who of no uh, fault of their own uh, are suffering or, or have not been successful and have uh, and are struggling. My, I, I'm, I'm convinced there'd be more charity than people would know what to do with. Uh, and uh, th that charity would then be focused on the kind of project and the kind of people that the that the contributors would be interested in. So it wouldn't be a one size fit all. Let's just take people's money and give it to a bunch of bureaucrats to figure out how to dole out. And for the government in the U.S., we have like a thousand different welfare programs at the uh, uh, local level, at the state level, at the federal level, all kinds of different programs, super inefficient. Instead, donors would insist that their money be used efficiently, productively to help people who really needed help. And I, I have no doubt. And indeed, if you go back to the 19th century, you know, America uh, grew up, if you will, really through the 1960s with zero welfare. I mean, uh, after, after the 1930s, there was a, a little bit through, um, uh, through uh, Social Security. But generally, there was no welfare for poor people. Uh, that, is an, that is something that was created during primarily during the 1960s. Before that, particularly in the 19th century, people were taken care of through charity. And there was plenty of charity. There were also all kinds of innovations, like market innovations. The beauty of a marketplace is they innovate in ways that we find it hard to imagine. Uh, but for example, there was such a thing as, uh, as uh, poverty insurance. So when you had a job, you could buy insurance that would pay you back if at some point you reach a certain level of a threshold of poverty, if you became poorer, then you would get, start getting insurance payments. There was unemployment insurance, not unemployment insurance paid for 
uh, by the government, but unemployment insurance paid for by private insurance companies. There were all kinds of mutual aid societies where people would get together and pay into a fund that would then take care of them at times of, of, uh, of bad economic outcomes. So there are plenty of ways in which we can voluntarily, without the use of coercion, without the use of force, take care of people who, for whatever reason, cannot at a given point in time take care of themselves. Oh, wow. Uh, 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 Thomas, Sowell, Thomas Sowell actually wrote a book on, on, on this, you know, on, on the welfare state. He said, he said the welfare state destroyed the black, uh, you know, African Americans group, you know, like, like he said. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I it, think destroys that not only, it destroys you not only economically because you become dependent on the welfare and you don't go out and strike for jobs, but it also destroys you psychologically because one of the ways in which human beings achieve self esteem. And through that self-esteem, ultimately achieve happiness and prosperity and self-confidence and good jobs and all of that. It's through the work that you do. Even if you're poor, the fact that you're working and putting food on the table is an immense source of pride. When that is taken away from you because you're now getting a check from the government instead of working, that pride is decimated and your self-esteem is destroyed. And therefore, you cannot achieve happiness and you become dependent, you become bitter and you become unhappy. And it destroys whole communities. So absolutely, I agree with Thomas Sowell that the welfare state is the worst thing that's happened to the African-American community and to poor people more broadly. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Uh, then, but uh, uh, how do you incorporate, incorporate morality into, into capitalism? I, I, I got, uh, a CEO actually called me some, some times ago, I think last year, and he asked me how much, how much should he pay his workers, you know, his his, uh, his, employ- his, his workers, and 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 he asks me like, you know, no, he doesn't actually know how much he, he he's supposed to pay them. No matter how much he pays them, they work, they would want more. They 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 would want more, and he feels like you know, he feels guilty of some sort. He, he feels guilty for not paying them enough as as much as they want, and also he feels like you know, he shouldn't pay them as much as they are demanding. So how do you compare? How do you know what how how much to pay? Your workers. I, I, I well, first of all, you don't owe your workers anything but compensation for their productive capacity. So the, you base how much you pay them on how productive they are and what the market will bear. That is, if you pay them too little, they will leave you. If you pay them too much, it's going to be very difficult for you to make a profit because your competitors are paying their employees less and they will outcompete you on price. So you have to pay your workers the right amount where you can make a profit. And will they, they might complain, but where they are going to feel like this is, um, this is worth their while. That is, they won't leave you. They won't go to your competitors. They won't go work somewhere else. So that balance is achieved in the marketplace through supply and demand. And you look at how many companies pay their workers. It doesn't vary that much. Uh, for a given level of skill, given level of productivity, because uh, if, if you pay too much, again, you become less profitable. If you pay too little, uh, workers will leave you. So uh, this is taken care of in the marketplace. And it's not an issue of morality. Well, it is an issue of morality only in the sense that morality demands that you act justly. What does justice mean? Justice means people treating people the way they deserve. And from perspective of wages, from the perspective of business generally, what does somebody deserve? Well, it depends how productive they are. So their dessert depends on their productivity, which is what, how you determine wages, not based on guilt. You owe them nothing. So guilt, you should never feel guilty about this. Not based on social pressure, not based on a morality of sacrifice. Uh, you know, their demands are based on the idea that because you have, you owe them. You must sacrifice to them because they do not have. They are, they are more needy than you. But that is the morality of altruism, and that is a morality I reject. Uh, you should be self-interested in all of your activities in life, including in business. And you should pay your employees that amount that will maximize your productivity and profits, ultimately. 
So long term, not in the short run. And that demands that they don't leave you. And that means that they're motivated to work hard for you. And that means that you, but you, you're, you're not paying them so much that you don't earn a profit. Uh, can you speak a little, a little bit on, 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 on self-interest, you know, self-interest. Self now, what do you define by, how do you define self-interest and, and selfishness? So self-interest and selfishness are pursuing your own rational goals. Uh, using your rationality, using your reason uh, in pursuit of those goals. So picking goals, picking values that further your life, and then using reason to achieve those values. So self-interest is not about emotion. It's not about, um, it's not about whim. It's not about the short term. It's about what's really good for you. So, you know, there could be, I don't know, a line of cocaine here. And I know if I take the cocaine, I'll get high. And, that, and people say, well, it's in your self-interest because you get yeah. high. And I go, no, because I know what cocaine does to me long term. I know the damage that it causes me. It plays its chemicals in my brain. The brain is my most valuable asset. I don't want to mess with that. No, even though I get a short term high, my long term interests are not to take the cocaine. So the whole point of the whole idea of self-interest for human beings, for every human being, is that rationality is the way in which we survive. We live over the long run. And therefore, in choosing our goals and in choosing our actions and in choosing our values and in making every choice in our life, we need to be rational. And that means we need to th think long-term about the consequences. And for that, what we need in order to make our choices more efficient and more productive, we need principles. So we need a set of principles that guide our actions. And that's what morality provides us. That's what a morality of self-interest, a morality of egoism, and a morality of selfishness provides us. It provides us with principles to guide our actions. So, for example, be rational, be honest, so that you don't every time calculate, oh, is honesty good for me now? Should I do it? What are the long-term consequences? No, prove to yourself once that honesty is a good strategy, that dishonesty is self-destructive, and just act that way. So we talked about justice, be just, you know, be productive. So we can go through the principles that guide your self-interest, but you need morality if you're going to be selfish, because you need principles to guide your self-interest. And the fact is, what is self-interested for you at a abstract level and what is self-interest for me is the same you know we achieve it in the same way every human being on the planet is structured fundamentally in the same way we're all human beings and therefore we're all the same kind of animal and given that we're the same kind of animal the same principles apply to all of us in terms of attaining our goals so Oh, wh wh why are people so so attracted to 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 stories of heroes and 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 you know of, sac of great sacrifice for others? Why why do you feel you know to some extent the movies we watch like like I think I mentioned Batman and and Superman and and uh, and these movies of great sacrifice for others? Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, why, why are we so attracted to those? Why are we so attra attracted to Jesus Christ? Why are we so attracted to those? attracted to saints you know so who, who, who make great sacrifices for others why are we so attracted to those stories because we've been brainwashed to do it i mean not brainwashed but we've been we've been uh, a whole value system is basically structured around christianity it's structured around the idea that the individual doesn't matter that the whole point of life is to sacrifice for others to sacrifice for God or to sacrifice for the community, for your friends, for, 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 for the nation, for the religion, for whatever, for the poor, the meek, the needy, that your life, in other words, means nothing. That's what Jesus Christ symbolizes. Jesus Christ symbolizes the fact that his life was meaningless, uh, that, that, the, that what mattered is all of our sins. He died for our sins. He didn't sin. He was perfect. He died for our sins. I can't think of a more evil thing in the world. I don't consider Jesus a hero. I consider Jesus a tragic, horrible, pathetic character, right? To the extent that he did this willingly because it was the will of God. Um, so, no, this is not a good thing. I, you know, Batman, 
it's terrible how people treat bad men, and he should he should stop. Right, the whole point of Atlas Shrugged. I don't know if you've read Atlas Shrugged. I've, if you haven't, I've, 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 I've checked the review online. The review online, but I've you know, the books are, are not available it. yet. All can the reviews are. It? You can download it onto onto your iPad or Kindle. Okay. I mean, it's all available on Kindle okay. electronically. But yeah. you should definitely read Atlas Shrugged. The whole point of Atlas Shrugged is that Batman should shrug. He should say enough. I'm not sacrificing my life all this. And in, in the, the nice thing about the trilogy. The Batman trilogy, if you remember, yeah. is at the end of the third movie, he's in Paris having a good time. And screw uh, Metropolis, right? Screw the city. They didn't appreciate what he was doing. He only suffered for them. And, and the real heroic thing to do, the, to be a real hero, is to live for yourself. Is to live a good life. Now, I don't like the superhero movies. I don't like the superhero movies for two reasons. One, it assumes that to be a hero, you have to be super. You have to have some special ability. Sure. And that's why of all the superheroes movies, I like Batman the most because they're, uh, it's all man-made. There's yeah, no yeah. super yeah. that he has. And second, I don't like them because to them, being a hero means the sacrifice. I hate the fact that Spider-Man is never going to get the girl. Uh, and it's positioned that way that he cannot get the goal and will never get the goal. Why can't you find, why can't we create a superhero that gets the goal, that's happy in life, that does his job, he saves humanity, but he saves humanity while having a good time and enjoying himself and getting the goal and having great sex and living a good life. That is a real superhero. A real hero is somebody who, Em embraces life and lives a good life and yeah i mean i'm all for if it's your profession to to protect uh you know if you're a policeman if you're a, if you're a fireman if you're a, if you're a soldier to be brave and 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 that's what you signed up for is is to protect people but not as an act of sacrifice as an act of fighting for your values as an act for fighting for the kind of world you want to live in but you see the whole mission of christianity and the whole mission of secular philosophy post-Christianity, uh, you know, has been to tell the individual he's worthless, to tell the individual the whole purpose of his life is to serve others. And that's what Ayn Rand, that's what Aristotle, that's what some philosophers here and there have rejected. And, and that's what I think every individual should reject. And until we reject, and, and in order to get to an ideal society, in order to get to the point where we eliminate the horrors that still exist in our world we need to get to a point where we uh, elevate the individual above the community and where we uh, elevate a morality of egoism above a morality of altruism all right all right uh, i think we should come back to objectivism in in, in general you know uh, uh what does ob objectivism say about about the idea man the objective philosophy what does it say about the idea man well, the ideal man is somebody who lives for himself. The ideal man is somebody who is rational, um, who, uh, who uh, makes decisions based on reason, based on facts, based on evidence, based on assessment of those, that evidence. It doesn't mean he never makes mistakes, but it means that he always tries to take into account all of the evidence and all of the facts. An ideal man never evades, never pretends not to see things, never ignores evidence or facts that is out there, um, and who lives for himself, as Ayn Rand put it, neither sacrificing himself for other people or other people to himself. He lives in an attempt, striving to achieve his own happiness, engaging with people on the basis of trade, on the basis of win-win relationship, where nobody is expected to sacrifice anybody else, whether it's love which is the most selfish of all relationships or friendship or in economics, uh, in, in, in work, actual engaging in trade. So um, that's what an ideal man is. Uh, uh, w w uh, uh, the idea of, uh, of, of, of uh, living for yourself, do you think this is something, I don't know, I think someone, I think someone mentioned this online also, I, I don't know. Do you think this is something that should be, you know, that should be personal about, do you think people would, is this one of those things that if you, if you, you know, repeat it often enough, 
people take it take it to the extreme like like the idea that love is selfish you know i'm i'm, I'm basically loving you for myself uh this is this is my thing you know i, I i'm yeah. i'm with you because of me not basically because of you or i don't know yeah. But do you think if people people if we repeat this thing these things often enough like love is selfish you know live for yourself people could take this to the extreme that that it could actually remove the spirituality of of the communion of 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 interpersonal relations. I think it would make interpersonal relationship better. I think it would improve the world dramatically. But we need to be careful not to suggest. That when we say these things, what we mean by them is, I don't know, some kind of subjectivism, some kind of um, uh, whim worship, emotionalism. What we need to be really clear is about that self-interest requires effort. Self-interest is hard. Being selfish requires real work. It requires the work of being rational. It requires the work of judging people. It requires the work of thinking before acting. It requires the work of integrating your emotions with your ideas. And, 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 and that's hard. And that's what we need. When people start embracing that idea, I think the world becomes a dramatically better place. And every time the world is approached, a, 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 an attitude of individualism, an attitude of people living for themselves, things have gone well. You, you could argue then in the latter part of the Enlightenment, people were taking on that attitude. You could argue that in uh, ancient Greece, there was that attitude alive. You could argue the 19th century America had, had that attitude. And, and I think those are some of the freest periods in human history, with the exception, of course, of, of, of the existence of slavery in, uh, in the U.S. and in Greece. No, slavery has uh, existed before the before before we for a very long time. Shall you know? You know, slavery is always. Yeah, uh, always, always existed. I, 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 it's I, only capitalism and the Enlightenment that yeah. ultimately got rid of slavery. La, got that got rid of slavery, and I and this is the, I think I mentioned Shion Kutsi in my first email to you. This guy, this guy is is a socialist, but but uh, and and he's a very good one. I, I don't mean the, the idea is good, but he's very good at conveying his his words and ideas and his basic comments that he, that he always reiterates is that is that now what about slavery what about what about exploitation in in in, in, in capitalism how do we uh, uh, that those are actually results of capitalism like you know and and i constantly repeat but slavery that. is the op- slavery is the opposite of capitalism slavery exactly. slavery is the negation of capitalism and indeed capitalism got rid of slavery it's the two most capitalist countries in the world England and the United States in the 19th century that eliminated yeah. slavery within their countries, eliminated the slave trade. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the, it's the uh, capitalism, the system of capitalism is based on the idea of treating individuals as traders, as, uh, uh, you know, as, as it, 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 the whole idea is anti-exploitation. The whole idea is win-win relationships. And if, you, if, if I'm not winning from this relationship, I'm free to walk away. And, and that's the negation of slavery and the negation of all exploitation. So, so uh, where exactly does it deviate from its ideals, you know? Because uh, I think one, one, when, when, we, when, we focus on, when we focus on in, individuals, the, the group tends to suffer. And when we focus on, on, uh, on, on the group, the individual tends to suffer. And because once we focus, I think, I think, I don't know if you might agree with this, that, that uh, the more the more uh, individualistic we are, the, like cap, ca, uh, in the capitalist sense, the more the more the the wage and uh, the wage gap actually increases. You know, and every single every single nation is actually experiencing this that that the richer are getting richer and and the upward mobility is becoming impossible. That uh, is that is completely wrong. Wow, <laughs> I understand. You know, but, but no, this is this is. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know. Like, I've seen some serious inflation in Nigeria recently. I've seen some yeah. serious inflation in Nigeria recently, and uh, yeah. and yeah. and the problem with this is that a lot of businesses are not getting out, going out of business. But those who are actually trying to start a business are unable to. They are unable to compete. You know, yeah. and and this increases the level of uh, uh, this increases the inflation. You know, this actually increases the inflation, and, and it is getting yeah. making life difficult for everyone. Sure, but what, what causes inflation? Yeah, that is the question. Well, the question is, the, the only cause of inflation is government. 
it's it's the central bank and it's government deficits. It's the government spending more than it brings in. So it's the combination of central banks printing money and the government spending like there's no, uh, you know, a, a, a deficit spending, which causes inflation. So under capitalism, there's no real inflation. On the contrary, under capitalism, prices drop over time. Prices actually go down. So this idea that inflation is caused by markets is just wrong. It, it, it's never been right. Inflation is a pure creation of government. And second, uh, the whole idea of inequality is is a bogus idea. I wrote a whole book on it. You should buy it. Yeah. And you should read it. Yeah. It's yeah. called Equal should... is Unfair. Yeah. And uh, the whole point is that if, from an empirical perspective, it's just not true. Under capitalism, uh, there's massive social mobility. The more capitalism, the more individualistic, the, 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 the smaller, the more limited the government, the less government interference there is, the more socially mobile people are. So if you care about social mobility, if you care about the poor's ability to rise up, what you want is more capitalism, more individualism, less government intervention, less government involvement. What causes the lack of mobility in modern societies today, what causes the poor to be stuck are government programs, welfare, licensing laws, regulations that limit employment. Those are the things that restrict the ability of companies, to, of, of, of poor people to rise up and become wealthy. But in the 19th century, in the heyday of capitalism, social mobility was super yeah. fast and, and, and prevalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, 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 under this philosophy, with this philosophy, do you think is diversity something to be praised? Or, or do you think uh, uh, people would, do you think we could have uh, harmony, harmony, like, like you know, uh, this uh, Chinese, Chinese, uh, Chinese, and uh, Chinese are, are a fan of harmony, you know, and yep. uh, and yeah. Uh, do you think we could have this uh, under under uh, an individualistic society? In, in an individualistic society, do you think? Do you think the only society? Yeah, the only society that can achieve harmony. Yeah, is an individualistic society. But what about China? all other societies? What about China? All non-individualistic societies bring about disharmony. They, they bring about warfare, violence, uh, tribalism. Uh, I mean, you can, you can see, you can see uh, everywhere in the world, it, you know, Africa, which is the least individualistic continent in terms of culture, uh, is the least harmonious culture. Wow. Uh, if, you, if you look at, if you look at uh, Europe, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, they were fighting all the time. There was a war. Every decade, there was a major war. People were slaughtering each other because of their religion, because of their nationality, because they, you know, because their prince didn't like their prince, whatever. Constant warfare in Europe throughout the centuries until capitalism, until individualism, until the Enlightenment. And then if you look from the Napoleonic Wars until World War I, peace. And then with the rise of ideas, about collectivism, anti-individualism, um, uh, racism, all the other ideas that started, uh, uh, socialism, communism, that rose up in Europe during the early 20th century, that harmony was shattered by what? By collectivism. And then if you look at post-World War II Europe, again, a period of relative individualism, you get peace again. Now, Europe is again breaking into tribes and into collectivism, and, and ideas of collectivism, and you're seeing more conflict and more strife than ever before. So it's exact opposite. The most harmonious societies are individualistic societies that take their individualism seriously. And the more collectivism, the more tribal, the more, uh, the more sacrifice you expect from people, the more Christian the societies are, the more violence there will be. But, but what about what about China? China from the from the Athenian Empire to the to the Greek Empire to the uh, to the uh, uh, British Empire. You know every single every single group group that actually rules. You know into to economic prosperity actually had some series of war war to actually aid their aid their aid their rise. But China, who I, which I think is is actually a collective society. 
because of the philosophy of Confucianism and, and, and the basic uh, commun- communist party, actually rose without any form of violence, at least to an extent, I, I understand the problem they are, they're having with Uyghurs in, in, in China. I, 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 can, I recognize that, but, but it is the only society, I think, actually rose without any, any form of violence to their, to their neighbors, you know, to, their, to, to, to nations around the world, with, you know? No, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but but the fact is that China's history, if you look at 5,000 years of Chinese history, yeah. it is filled with violence, constant warfare, constant struggle within China. So they keep, a, a king will rise up, he'll unify all of China, create a Chinese empire, and then a few generations later, it'll break up and there'll be civil war and they'll fight each other out. And then a new king will rise up and unify them all, and then it'll break up again. Yeah. And it's a constant up and down and up and down and up and down. And the fact is that because of this and because of the collectivistic nature of China and its tribal elements, that's what causes the civil wars, you know, all the different factions within China. Because of that, China, in spite of the fact that it, it, it led the West for, for during many centuries in terms of wealth and prosperity, has lagged. They, they, it took the, the Chinese to, to catch up with the Industrial Revolution it, it, it took them uh, almost 200 years to catch up to the West. And today, it's still significantly poorer than the West. On a per capita GDP, China is still poor. And the only reason China is relatively rich today as compared to its history is because starting in 1978, it has embraced principles of individualism. It has embraced principles of capitalism. It, the areas in China that have done well economically are those areas in China where the government has left individuals alone to pursue their own profit, to not, they haven't regulated them, they haven't taxed them heavily, and they've allowed them to flourish. They've allowed the individuals to pursue their own lives. And that has created harmony, the harmony of capitalism. Now, with Xi in power, trying to crush that and trying to regulate that and trying to control that, I believe China is going to enter a period of decline because it is reverting back to its old collectivism. It's reverting back to its old centralization of power and centralization of planning. And as a consequence of that, I think China is in decline. So it's when China embraces elements of individualism, it rises. And when it reverts to its tribalism and collectivism, it declines. So what what about the cultural cultural suffering you know like you know uh we uh do you think uh people would the cultural suffering you know like uh i can i, I notice to retain the cultural elements uh chinese cultural elements like, what i noticed is that they they stopped the like they restricted at least socially you know the connection their society has to to the west i think yeah, i'm not sure Say that again. I'm not sure I understand you. Okay. I, I mean to, to, as in to preserve their cultural heritage. For Chinese to pre- preserve their cultural heritage, and I, I know they are, they, were, they, are, they are very conscious of this. During the um, uh, Qing dynasty, uh, 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 late Qing, you know, late Qing, the, the dynasty before, uh, before Mao, Qing dynasty, well, yeah. they did something to the, uh, the old Buddha. Uh, Doja, uh, uh, Shishi actually. Uh, you movement, if, you, no. if you go, if you go to China, if you go to Shanghai, yeah, it looks like a Western country. If you go to Guangzhou, if you go to Dongguan, if you go to Shenzhen, what they've adopted is Western ideals. They this the, these cities are not built on Chinese principles. These cities are built on Western principles. The ideas of capitalism, of individualism, of profit. Of, 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 of self-interest. That's where the wealth has come from. Now, Xi doesn't like that. So he's trying to bring back these Chinese collectivistic elements, but that is going to hamper, restrict, and restrain the ability of China to grow. Hmm. I believe there is only one good culture. There's only one good civilization. I'm not a multiculturalist. I don't believe that all cultures are equal. Yeah. I believe one culture is better than everybody. Yeah. And that culture is the culture of capitalism and individualism. It is a culture of freedom. It's a culture which leaves individuals alone to pursue their own happiness with their, by their use of their own mind, pursuing their own goals. 
And anytime you try to collectivize that, standardize that, anytime you try to bring in your ancient culture, bring it forward, you are heading in the wrong direction. So I think China today is heading in the wrong direction. And I think the only reason it succeeded is because for a while there, under Deng Xiaoping and then the people who came after Deng, yeah. they pursued an anti-Chinese culture. They pursued a Western culture. And, and, and that's what led to their success. So um, it, it, it's Chinese culture is not good. It's uh -huh. too collectivistic. It's not good. It's not a good culture. It's too collectivistic. It's too family oriented. It's too sacrificial. And it's not individualistic enough. And I think what's happened, what scares Xi right now, what scares the Communist Party in China right now, is that after 40 years of relative freedom, many Chinese are rejecting Chinese culture and adopting a more individualistic uh, lifestyle. And that scares the authorities. And that's why they're trying to clamp down on it. But look, people, including Chinese, have been trying to move to the United States for 200 years. Why? To go to a better place, which means a better culture. Uh, you know, America has had, with you know, some uh, obvious exceptions, but it has generally a better culture than anywhere else. Why? Because it's an individualistic culture. You can be what you want to be in this culture. And that's why the Chinese immigrated here in the late 19th century until America stopped that for racist reasons. And that's why people from Latin America, from Africa, from Europe, everybody wants to come here. Not because we're worse, but because we're better. And if the rest of the world wants to become better, they should try to copy the good things about America, what made America great. And that's true of China, and that's true of any, every country. So uh, I think uh, that, that, that is right. And I think uh, uh, the, when, when, during China's rise and, and in Japan's rise, you know, in the 90s, 1960s or so, uh, foreign, foreign Chinese came back to invest in China. Like Chinese from around the world came back to invest sure. in China, and uh, sure. and Japanese also they came back to their country to invest in Japan. You know, isn't, yeah, isn't think that about how Japan became Japan? Yeah, Japan became Japan because of an atomic bomb was dropped on them. Then basically, what that bomb symbolized is that your culture sucks. <laughs> your culture led to this massive disaster. Yeah, yeah your culture, is, uh, yeah, your culture is no good. Yeah, you, you know this fascism, this Shintoism. This, this idea of, of collectivism is no good. Yeah. And, and the bomb proved that. An individualistic country like America defeated you, crushed you, brought you to your knees. And yeah. it's interesting that the Japanese took a constitution that was written by General MacArthur, an American-style constitution yeah. that was forced on them. And that constitution has helped them become one of the richest countries in the world and has helped them become one of the most successful countries in the world. Not because of Chinese culture, but because the rejection of Chinese culture and the adoption of Western values, that is the values of individualism. And that's why Japan has done so well. It's done so well because it embraced those individualistic principles, those principles of relative freedom. I wish they'd embraced them more consistently. If they had, they would be even better. But, but the returning, the returning, uh, the they returning were, Chinese investing in their country, choosing to invest in their country, sure. And uh, uh, that was the time. Okay, that was this time I tried to, I tried to uh, get a job in the USA, a remote job from the uh, from uh, uh, in the US, and and uh, I got some response that that it was during this coronavirus period, as, at least about two years ago, so a year ago. Uh, yeah, it was very and, good. yeah, and and I got some response that the Americans would actually prefer to hire Americans because they yeah, want, because Americans want to actually stay. They want the money to actually stay in their country. You know, they want they don't want so much full of money. And the same thing for Chinese returning yeah, investment in, 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 in Chinese invest. Isn't that from a collectivist idea? No, yes, but that's because they're collectivists, and that's bad. These are bad people, and it's a bad ideology. Uh, you know, Americans should want to hire the best, most qualified people, no matter where they come from. And America shouldn't care about whether the money leaves America because the dollars ultimately all flow back to America and the money leaving America is meaningless. It doesn't hurt America that the money goes overseas. On the contrary, it, it, it better establishes the dollar as, as, as a global currency. So 
No, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese went in, back to invest in China to some extent because their family there and they care about China, but to some to a large extent because they wanted to make money. Well, wow. China presented them with a great opportunity to make money. And they went back and they made money. And that's a good capitalist, individualistic, self-interested thing to do. And Americans should want to hire talented people from Nigeria because they want to make money. Not be tribal and only hire Americans. I think America is in decline. I think America is fading as a bastion of liberty and a bastion of freedom because of this kind of mentality. Mm. All right, I think I think we should return to the philosophical ideas of uh, of object, obje objectivism. You know, I think we should. That is not for 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 the economy. You know, I I I, I no, I think we should. So uh, this is this is uh, this is a, a question that I've been I've been I've been grappling with you know, for for for. I I had Stephen Pinker on my on my podcast some days ago. You know, and and we talked about we talked about morality. We talked we talked about ethics and and uh, and. Uh, and do you think uh, people, if everyone follows the rules of logic, uh, do you think we would arrive at least morally, you know, objectivism actually signifies some, uh, some kind of obje objective, object objective ideal, you know, that if we all uh, apply the rules of logic and reason, we would all come to the same conclusion. I, I, am I right? Am I right about, right about that? We would all come to the same conclusions about the principles, about what are the principles that should guide you morally. But we wouldn't come to the same conclusions about the specific values that each one of us pursues. We wouldn't all decide on the same profession. We wouldn't all fall in love with the same woman. We wouldn't all pursue the same art. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. But if we were all logical, if we were all rational, we would all come up with the same principles to guide our lives. Yes, because those principles are based on human nature as a universal, not in the specific uh, specifics of your uh, 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 values and uh, and makeup. So, but, but, but by what standard, you know, by what by the standard, standard of human the, life? The, the standard the, is human life. The standard is looking at human life and saying what leads to successful human life and what destroys human life. What is good for human beings? What is bad for human beings? So it's an empirical question. We can look into reality, evaluate it, come up with some principles, and then test those principles logically. Make sure they are logically all integrated, that they're all logically all connected. But, but that, is, that, is, that is the basis, yes. And, and you are against passing these conclusions through... I, 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 I watched your... Your, your your debates with uh Yoram uh on 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 Lex Friedman podcast and uh, yep. you you are you are uh, against passing these conclusions you know through traditions and 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 dogmas you know do you think uh, do you think uh everyone is capable of making these uh <laughs> I don't know I, do you think everyone is capable of making the as in making the tax, you know, as in doing the tax of actually thinking for themselves, actually thinking for themselves about probably, what to do. Probably not. Probably not. Right. But uh, a lot of people are. And I think that it's the responsibility of the people who can think for themselves, who have the intelligence to understand a complex philosophical issue. It's their responsibility to do the work and then go out and teach people what it means, how to do it, how to live well. And at some level, everybody can understand what that means and how, uh, in, in what it's done. And, uh, you know, that, those, that cultural transmission from the intellectuals to the masses, that's what needs to happen. But it can't just be, okay, people, you should all be egoistic because that's our tradition. The intellectual has to be able to explain to the people why they should act in their self-interest, not at the same level of detail, that a philosopher would require, but at a level of detail that an average person can get, can comprehend. But if, you, if your basis for thinking something is good is because it's always been done this way, that is a recipe for ultimately for disaster because it doesn't mean they have to invest any time in really understanding how it works. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't entail them actually having to defend it. And somebody else can come and say, yeah, but I have a tradition too. 
And my, my tradition is different. No, we have to be able to provide logical explanations at the level appropriate for the people hearing our explanations. So every generation has to relearn these things. The intellectuals at a very high level and the common people at a lower level, but still at some level. So as in what is the contrast between, between this and freedom? You know, I think when... when, when between what? Between uh, objectivism and uh, as in this ideal of objectivism, the individualist in, the individual aspect of it, and you know, thinking for yourself and 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 uh, and freedom, you know, freedom to do what you want, and uh, yep. I and what is, is there a contrast between it all? Well, it's important. It's important in the sense that if you believe that people don't have reason and therefore cannot take care of themselves and a, a need to have their hand held, need to, uh, like Yom Chazoni believes, that people cannot take care of themselves, they won't do the right thing, we need to guide them, we need to help them, we need to hold their hand, and we need to force them, we need to coerce them. Then you're going to believe in statism, then you're not going to be pro-freedom. To be pro-freedom means to be pro the idea that individuals can take care of themselves, that they can make the right choices about their own life, that they do have agency, and that agency is meaningful. That is, it can result in something positive and, and, and good in the world. Well, okay. Uh, and and but, but, uh, how do you make sure these, these ideas are, are passed down through generations? You know, you know, like... It's called education. It's, it's the same way that all ideas are passed on from one generation to another. It's not about tradition. It's about education. I mean, how... How will Christian ideas be passed on for, 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 for uh, you know, uh, centuries? Uh, education, preaching, explanation, education, 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 from when you're young all the way through. And, and through training, training young people to use their mind. Not training them on the ideas, training them on the efficaciousness of their mind. It's by teaching them to think. One of the things we don't do enough of in school is to teach people how to think. That's what we should be doing. And you do that by teaching them both facts and methodology. All right. Uh, that was something I, I, I mentioned to you through my, uh, the first time I, the time I actually, first time I actually made you, I mentioned uh, uh, how to break uh, my, my tax, my, my goal in breaking the ethnic, ethnic division in Nigeria. I think I mentioned that and I wanted to do that through education. Would, would, you, would you have any objection to my method? You know, I, I, I have this non-profit um, I plan on partnering with the government to actually educate uh, the whole of the country, you know, and actually re-educate the whole of the country because I think the current education system in Nigeria has actually done a bad job at educating yep. the whole country. That's why people are so tribal, you know, and I don't think most people are even able to actually identify what the problem is, what the problem with the country is, you know. At the moment, you know, uh, there is an election coming up next year, and 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 people are up to now, I, I don't speak on politics generally on my, on my, on my, on my, on Twitter or on social media, but I think people are, are, are making the wrong, wrong choice again. Once again, they're making the I wrong agree. choice. Yeah, yeah, in, in but, about... That's because, so I think you're right, the problem in Nigeria, like in most of the world, is tribalism. It's, it's collectivism. If you can partner with, uh, your nonprofit can partner with the government, and actually be effective in educating people, and not be overly controlled by the government, right? Because yeah, you're, you're yeah. making a deal with the devil, right? Yeah. And, and you have to be careful that they don't take over your curriculum. But if you can actually promote a curriculum that, that, that supports freedom, that'd be good. It would be better if you could work with private schools and if you would encourage the creation of private schools. And I know there are a lot of private schools in Nigeria. Yeah. But yeah. to promote a good, positive curriculum that teaches people how to think for themselves. There's nothing more important than teaching people how to think for themselves. Nothing. Yeah. And all other problems will go away if we can just do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this is my last question for this, you know, for this uh, 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 engagement, you know. <laughs> what do you think, uh, uh, what do you think is the, is the meaning of it all? You know, I think you are an, a, a, an advocate for reason and, and, and this was a topic we discussed on, on uh, I have this show coming up next week and uh, next week, Friday and uh, people are like, like I shouldn't. Some people told me to not be so, as in 
should not be so quick to diminish religion and 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 and, and faith and because it gives meaning to people's lives and 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 that is what I'm trying to do by to break the ethnic boundary in Nigeria. That is what I'm trying to do. So, so what are your views on religion and and what do you think is the meaning of like your views on religion? You are Jewish, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, kind yeah, of. So, yeah, um, I was born Jewish, but look, uh, religion is a primitive form of philosophy, mm -hmm. but it's not a very good philosophy. It's a philosophy ultimately of irrationality, of mysticism and a morality of altruism. And therefore, religion plays into tribalism and ultimately violence. Uh, part of the problem you have in Nigeria is religion. Uh, I mean, look at what, what, what uh, some uh, in the name of Islam are doing in the northern part of your country. Um, what we are arguing for is the rejection of faith, the rejection of mysticism, the rejection of altruism. And the problem in our society, in your society in particular, is that people find meaning in religion instead of finding meaning in their own lives, instead of finding meaning in their careers, instead of finding meaning in their relationships, instead of finding meaning in themselves, they seek meaning in some other being. That's the problem in the world. That's the problem that needs to be solved. We need to bring people away from religion and focused on their own well-being, focused on their own life, and focused on their own reason. That's how you save the world. And we need to save it from religion, among other things. Yeah, yeah. Religion and tribalism and collectivism of all forms. So, so what should replace, replace religion? This is the question. This is the question. Philosophy. <laughs> philosophy replaces religion. And, and, and philosophy, uh, that's why you need philosophy. Ayn Rand has a wonderful essay called a philosophy who needs it. Ooh. It's online for free. Go read it. It's a fantastic essay. Everybody needs philosophy. Philosophy should replace religion. Uh, everybody should adopt a philosophy and live by a philosophy. Uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the idea that we need religion um, is very sad and very destructive. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks for coming on my show. It's been one hour. I think we do this one. Pleasure. Today, you know, when I'm when I'm when I go through the books, uh, your uh, your book and uh, an Iran book, I will invite you back on. Sounds good. Thanks, Daniel, and uh, uh, good luck with the show. Thank you. Thank you.